Thanks very much, Jeremy, for, for joining us for this conversation. Uh, to introduce everybody, uh, today I'm speaking with Jeremy Sutton Hibbert, who's a photographer based out of Glasgow. Uh, he's been working for over 30 years as a professional photographer, and I've known, uh, known him for the last seven or eight years, anyways, um, working in Scotland. So, Jeremy, thanks very much for, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. It's, uh, it's nice to be given a chance to chat about my pictures. Yeah. Uh, so the reason we're talking today is um, to celebrate the new acquisition for the School of Scottish Studies Archive, um, part of our 70th, uh, 70th anniversary celebrations. Uh, so in a minute here, I'll, I'll share my screen and, um, and we can talk about some of the images that are uh, part of the, that new, new acquisition. Um, but maybe beforehand, just talk uh, a bit about your own background and your own work. Uh, you're based, based out of Glasgow, but you yeah. photograph all over the world, right? <laughs> Yeah, I'm based in Glasgow, like you said, I've been working, I got my first camera when I was nine years old, and then when I was 16, I went to college in Glasgow to do photography uh, for three years, photography and design, and then it was during my second summer holiday at college that I kind of thought uh, maybe photography can actually become a, a profession for me. I had travelled to Israel and Egypt for a couple of months and took pictures, and the tutors at the college liked those pictures, and kind of encouraged me to do kind of reportage type work. Uh, and that was the first time I really thought, wow, I can really, uh, I could travel the world and I can make the photography somehow make that happen and pay for it. And, and that's what I've gone on to do. Uh, I've been working for 31 years. I've always been freelance. I come from a kind of editorial, reportage, photojournalism background, give it whatever title you want. Uh, yeah, and it's gone okay, thankfully. Still, yeah. in, still in the business. <laughs> I mean, yeah, a, a lot of a lot of reporting photographers you know, go out in the world, and, and and that's what they go and do. But uh, I mean, you found a, a great deal of artistic pleasure in kind of coming back to to Scotland time and again, and kind of refocusing in on both professional projects but also personal projects, um, looking at at Scot Scotland and Scottish life and Scottish people. Yeah, um, I had the I had the pleasure of leaving Scotland for a while. Mm -hmm. I went and lived in Japan for ten years, and I worked over there for newspapers and magazines as a, I guess, as a bit of a foreign correspondent for 10 years. Uh, so, and then when I came back to Scotland about nine years ago, by that point, editorial photography was on the decline in terms of the numbers of assignments given out and money available to do projects. So uh, I became working with my colleagues in Document Scotland. I, you know, we started doing a lot more of our own work. I, I had always done my own personal work because I, I always knew that was important and I didn't want to just do commissions. I always wanted to photograph the things that I was interested in. But but yeah, latterly, the last kind of decade, roughly, I've worked more on my own stuff and exhibited that and tried to get it into collections such as the School of Scottish Studies. Yeah. And can you, um, I mean, you mentioned it there very briefly, Document Scotland. Uh, before we get going on the, the pictures, you want to say a word or two about what uh, Document Scotland is, seeing as you're one of the co-founders? Yeah, so when I was coming back from Japan to Scotland in 2012, I knew that all eyes would be on Scotland for a couple of reasons. We had the Scottish independence referendum coming up a couple of years later, and we had the Glasgow Commonwealth Games, the sports games coming up a couple of years later. And I had always felt that, documentary photography, recent documentary photography from Scotland had been a bit ignored by maybe the picture editor world in London. Uh, if you ask people who was the, the last kind of photographers or photojournalist or documentary photographer you knew from Scotland, people would probably tell you Oscar Marzaroli, the great Oscar Marzaroli. Uh, and as much as we admire his work, uh, it was 40 years ago, 50 years ago. And there's a lot of great photography been done since. And that's why I wanted to try and champion a little bit. Uh, and knowing that all eyes would be on Scotland, I thought there would be a need for photography from Scotland. And as such, I approached a couple of colleagues that I had known and worked with and whose work I respected. And then we, we, we got another member. Uh, and, all, and then very quickly, it was four of us. And we set up Document Scotland. And we've been trying to work on bigger projects and exhibitions ever since and that has gone pretty well yeah yeah well, certainly certainly gone well i mean it's through document scotland that we got to know each other in the first instance a long time ago um it was back in 
2015, 2016, something like that. Yeah. I was. Uh, back so, yeah, I mean, Document Scotland, we've gone on to, <coughs> uh, we've gone on to do exhibitions in England, France, Belgium, Edinburgh, the National Portrait Gallery in Edinburgh, very nicely for eight or nine months. Yeah, that was a good. Uh, show. Next year, we haven't announced it yet, but next year we've been invited to have a big show uh, in Europe, which is right. which is nice because it's nice to. <laughs> I just got to think carefully what I can tell you. It's nice to take Scottish photography out of Scotland and get it seen elsewhere. So we're very excited about that plan for next year. Good. All right. Well, let's uh, let's turn to to the photographs. So um, the the school um, uh, uh, spent some time working with you to 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 under understand your work and also get a feel for what might be the best fit uh, with the the collections and settled on uh, three different collections which span uh, about 15, 15 years or so of your work. Maybe maybe a little bit longer than that. Kind of about twenty years of your work. Well, yeah, I'd have to work it out. But yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Almost twenty years of work. So Jeremy, this uh, so the first series that we'll we'll have a look at is uh, your coal mining series, uh, which was uh, based out of um, a colliery in Fife. Do you want to set the scene a little bit for us? Yeah, this was kind of a, sometimes I, I've shot so much in my career that I kind of forget exact dates. But this was early two thousands, and I was working a lot at that time for Saturday Sunday supplement magazines for like the Scotland Sunday, the Glasgow Herald magazine, Sunday Times magazine. And it was really a period in my career where each week I'd go out with my two Leica cameras, rolls of black and white, and I could pretty much choose topics to go and photograph, knowing that once I'd done the picture six weeks later or a month later, they would be in one of the supplement magazines. And it was a really kind of rich period for me for shooting images and getting them published. Yeah. And this, this visit to Longanet Colliery in Fife uh, came about via the Herald magazine, the Glasgow Herald Saturday magazine, I believe it was. Uh, and, and I forget if I approached them with the idea or they came to me, I, I'm, I, I'm not really too sure. Uh, but Longanet Colliery was the last commercial deep coal mine in Scotland. It flooded about five, one of the, one of the seams or tunnels, whatever, it flooded about five months after I did this project. I, I know even a project, this assignment, yep. and it was deemed not commercially viable to, to rescue it. And that brought an end to this coal mine. Right. Uh, so I guess in a way, the timing was, uh, from my point of view, fortuitous in that it was Indeed. very close to the end. And when so yeah, so this was, uh, if, I, if my memory serves me correct, this was really a one day assignment. Uh, it was the kind of, kind of job you'd be sent off with a journalist perhaps for a day and you're given a tour of the, the premises, you know, the manager or a coal miner or a press person would give you a tour and I would shoot like crazy, shoot pictures like crazy, trying to get as much done as possible in the brief time that I was allowed. Yeah, yeah. And with this, I mean, um, as we go through, I'll just click through a couple of the images. I mean, with, with this uh, assignment, you, you didn't go down into the mines, right? I mean, you were- No, you were... that first picture, which shows the coal coming up from, uh, from the mines is as, as kind of as close as I got. And I use that picture because it at least gives the impression of being underground, even though it's not exactly, <laughs> but it at least gives the impression of being underground and you get to see some coal. Yeah. But, Coal mines are obviously there's very important health and health and safety issues involved, and yeah, it was of course I I was like pleading with them and asking and you know, oh can I go down to the mine can I go down, but they said no like your camera, uh, your cameras could when you take a picture with your camera it could cause a spark and blow the whole thing up, <laughs> now, but at that time I was using. Like a mechanical cameras, you know, yeah. it's maybe got a small battery in it for the meter. Yeah. But to this day, it kind of makes me a bit frustrated when you hear these kind of things. You even hear it now, some days that that same line when you photograph at distilleries, actually. Uh, right. People say, No, no, your camera can cause an explosion. And it's like, I'm not using a big magnesium bulb, you know, like they're like, <laughs> oh, like with a big plume of smoke, like. Uh, and I remember the person who told me, no, you can't go into the mine, your camera is, isn't 
certified, it's not safe. He then produced a little digital kind of compact to show me this one's okay. And I'm thinking, that's probably worse than what I've got. <laughs> so it's a bit frustrating. So yeah, so all my pictures from Longana are all on the surface. Yeah. And I had to somehow convey the idea of getting underground. Yeah, yeah. These gents are, uh, I forget exactly if they were just finishing or just starting uh, their, their shift. I believe it was 10 hour shifts underground. But nice. this is the little train that would take them from the surface down to down to underground. Yeah. 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 So basically, I mean, I would be I'd be given a bit of a guided tour of this place. And for instance, here where the guys are coming off the train or about to go down, these guys look a bit dirty. They're probably coming off the train. Yeah. Uh, they've probably come back up from being underground. I would just kind of try and loiter there and photograph as much as I possible. Probably I had somebody from the mine shepherding me around and they'd be kind of five feet behind me, watching me, waiting. And I would just really try and spend as much time as possible yeah. and shoot as much as possible. Such is, such is the way of being a kind of an assignment photographer for newspapers or magazines in that you learn to work very, very quickly. Uh, because you know that, I mean, some assignments only last a couple of minutes, to be honest, if you're photographing somebody in an office sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, so in a situation like this, when you're given a guided tour, I, I'll milk that occasion for all I can photographically before, you know, you get the tap on the shoulder to say, OK, let's move on. We'll show you something different, show you a different building or somewhere else. So, so it's really up to me to... to uh, can I can I ask you a little bit about photographing people? I mean, so, so much of your work and some of your best work is is getting people in the moment. But I, I imagine for every one of those kind of golden shots, you do get lots of shots of people being cheeky in front of the camera as well. And I mean, how do you balance that out as as a photographer and and being in the element and trying to blend in as well? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. A photographer has to be a chameleon. Mm. You know? You have to be a chameleon because you have to be kind of invisible to get what you want. But then at other times, depending on the situation, you have to be a bit of a kind of joker in a way to, to get what you want quickly. Uh, so, I, and it really depends on the situation. So like, for instance, in a situation like this with the miners, I'm probably trying to be invisible. I'm probably just trying to let it happen around me and, and react to what I'm seeing. These guys are laughing at a joke of their own. I, I don't even remember why they're laughing. Uh, what I don't like about this, this picture actually too much is, I, I like the guys laughing, but the guy behind looking straight into the camera, yeah, he's I, dead. I he's don't dead like people looking straight into the camera in that kind of situation because I want the viewer to kind of feel that they're there in that situation. And, I don't know, having somebody look straight to the camera kind of disturbs that a little bit for me. Yeah. Uh, so in that situation, I'm probably trying to be invisible and trying to just react to, to what I'm seeing. But, but other times, if I have to do a portrait of somebody, say a CEO of a company, mm. I'm shown into a boardroom, which is very still and quiet, and I've got a guy in a suit, and I've got five minutes with him. Mm. And... I need to get something out of that situation. I need to get a picture. I need to get a reaction or some sort of moment of reaction from him or interaction between us. Uh, and there's lots of tricks you can use as a photographer. We all, I think many photographers all have little tricks. And, and sometimes in these situations you become, I become a bit kind of Jack the lad, a little bit cocky character. You know, you, you know little things you can say to people which will get a response, like get a, you know, a nice response in some way. Uh, you don't, I mean, I don't insult people or get cheeky, but no, no, you get, get them to at least I hope not. But, yeah. but you know how to provoke a little reaction from people. Or if I'm in a, in a room where there's a team of people, like recently I've been working with uh, lots of nurses and doctors mm -hmm. and you're in a team and maybe there's one or two people that are a little bit mouthy while you're photographing their colleague. You learn lots of lines which you can use as a very quick way to turn that situation and maybe hush them down a little bit yeah. or, or to get the atmosphere or, or sometimes to make it a bit livelier, you know, little lines, little jokes. 
And if you were to come with me every week on assignments, you would soon realize I use the same lines and same jokes. <laughs> all the time, right? <laughs> so, yeah. so, yeah, so you have to be a bit of a chameleon. You have to know how to interact with people. People ask about the cameras I use and what do they recommend. And being the kind of photographer I do is not about technology. I mean, you have to use technology and use it well and know it will work for you. But it's really about being a people person yeah, and about being able to interact with people. You know when to be quiet. You know when to be invisible. You know when to be Jack the Lad and like try and stoke the atmosphere a wee bit to get a reaction. You know, yeah. you yeah. have to. It's, uh, but I imagine with a bunch of coal miners coming off a train, <laughs> you don't have to do much. Uh, no, I reckon they're, they're pretty happy to be coming off that train. Yeah, so. yeah I'd say so. You know. This was another room we get taken to. This is, uh, I believe, where they, all the battery packs for the, the lights on the helmets, these are all battery packs and lamps, and they all get put on to charge between, between shifts. Right. This is, I always wonder if this guy has, I'm never, I'm never sure if he's got two cigarettes in his mouth or whether the shutter speed was slow enough that somehow the cigarette has kind of like moved in the sh within the, the shutter duration. It I'm looks like, sure. it looks like two cigarettes to me. It does look like two cigarettes, you know, maybe he's been a long time underground and he's gasping <laughs> for a cigarette. Just don't light it underground, you know. Yeah. Uh, but this was the, uh, the changing rooms where they, you get ready to go to work and then shower and come back and change. And it was quite interesting. You know, I was given complete freedom to photograph here. I mean, I even uh, have some pictures of the guys in the shower, all yep. naked, uh, and nobody complained about being photographed. These are all middle-aged Scottish guys, you know, bit of a pot belly, bit of a beer belly on them, not the most handsome physiques. But yeah. none of them gave a damn about being photographed huh. in the shows. And one thing I always remember from, from uh, that story was uh, one of the miners said to me, they always remember who broke the picket lines during the infamous miner strikes in the, in the Margaret Thatcher era. And they always mm -hmm. remember who broke the picket lines and who was and called a scab. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And to that day, so this was years after those strikes. To that day, those guys, the guys who broke the picket line, had to shower alone. Nobody would share a shower with them. Ah. So you had a big communal shower with maybe like 10 showers or 12 showers, something like that in it. Uh, but if you had broken the picket lines and it was remembered, you showered by yourself. Right. right. I always remember that. Interesting. Huh. Let's, uh, who's this guy? This was a guy, George, he was, uh, I guess he was my chaperone. I remember him taking me around for a while. And uh, here he is, this is outside the pit. And there's a big pile of coal and he's got a piece of coal in his hand. Mm. This actually, I believe, ran as like the kind of main picture. Oh no, actually I'm getting that wrong, don't I? Uh, but this ran in the, in the magazine. But when I was talking to him, he, he told me that he came from a family of miners. Uh, that his father had been a coal miner and his grandfather had been a coal miner. And again, when you're working on assignments or working on stories or working with people, you're always listening out for like these little things that can lead on to another picture or another story. And, uh, and I remember as soon as he said, oh yeah, you know, like my dad and my granddad were miners, I, I had to say kind of tactfully and respectfully, uh, are they both still with us? Are they both still alive? Uh, and they were. And I thought, well, that, what a nice picture that would be to get three generations of, uh, of miners. Yeah. So I asked him if we could do it, and he said he would speak to them and, 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 try, and uh, try and sort it. Right. And that's what the image is, yeah? And there we go, yeah. And then the next picture is uh, we, we went to a pub. The, I remember that this happened, I think, about a week or two after I'd been at the coal mine. And I had to keep phoning him just to say, you know, is it possible? And his granddad, who's on the left, the uh, left as we look at the picture, uh, would only go to a certain pub. I think it was a miners kind of pub. Right. And he would he would only go to this one pub. So so I went there that afternoon, uh, and he brought his family. Hmm. 
I, I remember going in and it was real traditional working class, normal kind of pub, you know. And uh, I remember I was at the bar buying the beers for them, buying the beers. I don't know if I got them on expenses. And, uh, and I remember buying the beers and turning around and the sunlight was coming in and they were probably smoking already, you know, and you, you see the cigarette smoke and hanging in the air and you yeah. just think, you know, that's the picture I came here for. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly what I wanted, you know. Yeah. Uh, no, that's a fantastic story and fantastic picture as well. So. Thank you. Yeah, it's nice. I just think, you know, it's, it's kind of why we do photography. It's to, to capture these moments and... Uh, I mean, I wonder now, I mean, these pictures are almost 20 years old, I guess. Uh, yeah. I wonder, could you even do that picture now? Well, A, there'd be no cigarette smoke in the pub, yeah. but could you do a picture of three generations of a Scottish mining family? I don't know yeah. if you could even find that now. It'd be pretty yeah. hard, pretty rare. It'd be pretty rare, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's move on to, to the next series, okay? Yeah. Ah, right. Okay, so this is your... Your... This is Paddy's Market in Glasgow, yeah. which Pad Paddy's Market is a bit of, uh, I guess, a kind of an easy way to describe it, a kind of flea market in a way. It's a bit, you know, it's a market where you could buy secondhand goods. Uh, it took place in a lane down in the, just off the city centre, towards, towards the kind of Trongate area of Glasgow, just beside the River Clyde. And... The history of this market goes back apparently about 200 years. So it was very historic within Glasgow. Uh, and, and also by the, at the time I photographed, again, this is early 2000s, uh, it was a little bit notorious in that there was a little bit of criminality involved within the market. There was a bit of drug dealing going on and selling of cigarettes and alcohol that tax hadn't been paid on. So it had a bit of a, a slight notorious reputation. I mean, I think there was a, a lot of the stalls and a lot of the little shops, like the one we're looking at there, were, you know, just normal, decent people running businesses. But at one end of the market, at the River Clyde end, there was this little bit of uh, illegality yeah. going on. Uh, so I think as we look at that picture there, I think the... Uh, the River Clyde is to my back, actually. So, yeah, so this was, you know, it's a very famous market within Glasgow, very historic. And I went there just to photograph for myself. I decided, it, it was always rumoured that the Glasgow City Council were going to close it. And I wanted some pictures of it before it closed. Mm -hmm. I think it was a, maybe a couple of years after I went that it, it finally closed, or a few years after. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was rumoured to close for a long, long time. Uh, that's the Sheriff Courts on the right-hand side there. That big plain wall is the courts. Uh, so, so I went there with my with my Leica cameras, which are very small, you know, just loaded with black and white film. And again, as I mentioned earlier, like being a bit of a chameleon, I tried to, dare I say, dress appropriately for the job. You know, sometimes you have to wear a suit on a job because you know that wearing a suit will buy you an extra few minutes with a business person. Other times you dress down a wee bit. So I, I, I try to just you know, dress as a normal guy. You're not going to stand out. I get, maybe I had one camera or two. I don't remember how many of my Leicas I had with me. Usually I would work with two Leicas and a pocket full of film, pocket full of black and white film. And I would just walk up and down this little cobbled lane. It was maybe 200 metres long, this lane, 300 metres at the most, I'd imagine. And I would just walk up and down and walk up and down. And, you know, another another little trick of kind of being accepted is to be seen talking to people. So, you know, if some stall owner talked to me, I would stand there and talk to them because you always hope that if it looks like you know people, then people kind of accept you a bit more. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I mean, it was a really, again, it was a little, wasn't a huge in-depth project for me, but it was nice to have some pictures of the market. Like I say, it closed many years later. Uh, it was nice to, to get some pictures. This woman's looking at a book and uh, if you zoom in really close, you can see it's actually, it's a photograph of Dresden Cathedral. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember somebody describing this market to me as the kind of place where you could go to buy one shoelace. <laughs> 
while, while you mentioned it, uh, I was just talking a little bit about technique. Uh, most of your work, not all your work, most of your work is is in black and white. Um, you've got a couple of series that you've done that are really fantastic in color as well. But can you talk a little bit about um, you, where you're... Yeah, where I would say I used to, it used to be predominantly black and white. Uh, you know, I always kind of wanted to be that kind of black and white kind of photographer working for big famous photo agencies, whatever. A, and I enjoyed the aesthetic of working in black and white. But <clears throat> as photography has changed in the digital era, it, it's actually, you know, it's harder now to get black, unless you're doing it yourself, perhaps, it's harder to get black and white processed these days. The photo yeah. labs are not really doing it anymore. Uh, and digital is so common now that around this time, around 2003, 2005, so maybe a couple of years after these were taken, a, I kind of had to make the change to digital because I've always been a working photographer. I only make my money from photography. And if I wanted to stay in the business, working for newspapers and magazines, I had to change to digital. It's just the way the industry went. And I was that editorial photographer, so I had to go with the industry to an extent. Uh, so gradually my work became color. I, and now I work in color. I, I don't really, working black and white the past few years uh, right. it's all it's all digital and you've been going back i mean recently throughout uh, lockdowns you've been going back through a lot of your old work uh, you were telling me previously kind of sorting and doing things has, has it been nice to revisit some of your early early work or some of the, the black and white work that you haven't seen in a while yeah 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 absolutely i mean the uh, photographers kind of look back on like their favorite pictures or the pictures they're known for and they kind of treat them as children in a way you know they're your babies, your darlings, and you have to look after yeah. them, you know. Uh, but yeah, during lockdown, I just, in, in this room, I I had to I had to change rooms within the house. My daughter wanted a different different room, and all my negative binders were on the floor, piled up in a big heap. And they sat there for a couple of months, really a bit messy, and I was really <laughs> just getting to me. And then during lockdown, when we couldn't really travel. And the photo assignments had gone very quiet because nobody could travel because of the COVID lockdown. Uh, I was looking at all my negative binders thinking, okay, this is the time to uh, get it all sorted. And uh, I've spent the past few months knocking it all into shape, you know, archiving it well, cataloging it well, and, and latterly beginning to scan a lot of work, which I've never scanned mm -hmm. up. So I've been seeing seeing pictures which I shot back in the early 90s, which mm. I, since I shot them and they were used by the client, I've never done anything with them. But it's very nice to, to go back and, and revisit everything and, and find work which is good enough to be showing and using and you wish you had scanned it years ago. But <laughs> I guess I was, just, I was just too busy out photographing more stuff. Too busy working, right? Yeah, too busy working. You know? yeah. Too busy. Keep moving forward, you know? Yeah. All right. The the last series um, that we'll talk about is your your North Sea fishing series. Yeah. Yeah. This is uh, I guess one of the projects people know me for. I I guess. I this is back. This picture is December nineteen ninety two, I believe. So I had only been photographing professionally for probably two years. Right. And the the Scotsman newspaper in Edinburgh said to me okay, can you do an assignment out overnight on a fishing boat? There's going to be a demonstration by Scottish fishing boats the next morning. The Royal Yacht Britannia was coming in up the 4th of 4th into Leith mm. to take up her berth in Leith. And the fishermen were going to be kind of escorting Britannia in as a flotilla, but as a demonstration about, you know, fishing quotas and fishing rights. Yeah. Uh, so I get sent out overnight on a on a boat. The boat was called the Myriad, uh, which is obviously in this picture I, I'm on the boat, and this is early morning, and all the other all the other fishing boats. But on the on this trip, which was like I say, just an overnight trip, it was enough to give me a little taste. And I said to the skipper Ronnie Hughes, I said, uh, "So you know, how long do you go out for?" And he said, "Ah, you know, like a week, ten days." And I said, "Can I come with you sometime?" And uh, when he had finished laughing, he said, yeah, if you think you can handle it, you know, he said, but if, you, if you're going to be seasick, like, I'm not taking you back in. Right. I'm up for it. You know, I was, 
<laughs> young and keen yeah. and uh, up for adventure. Yeah. And about two or three months later, I went back with his crew on the same boat and I went out to the North Sea for about seven days or so. And we right. did a trip trying to catch cod and haddock. So that would have been February, March time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went in February, February 93, I believe it was. Right. Yeah. It's, uh, the first couple of days at sea were really flat calm. Hmm. So it was really good. I managed to get my sea legs and I wasn't sick, I was proud to say. That's good. Uh, and I, I enjoyed that. I, I had a great time. And then I, I sub subsequently went on a, a second boat uh, called the Argosy out of Peterhead. Uh, and it's quite funny because I did those trips in the North Sea and the North Sea is, is quite a kind of, apparently it's quite a shallow sea. So it's quite a, quite a rough sea. And uh, I really got my sea legs on those trips and I, and I went on to have a career where I did quite a lot of ship-based assignments. Yeah. And I've been in the, the Southern Ocean a couple of times, which is a, a huge sea with mountainous waves. Yeah. Uh, and I've never got seasick. I've always been practically a last man standing on the boat when everybody else is getting sick. And I put it all down to my North Sea training on these uh, on these boats. You know? Trial trial by fire, right? Yeah. 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 Let's uh let's look at the series a little bit. So this is is this still on Myriad? Uh, I think that one's the Myriad, yeah. I can't quite remember off the top of my head. Most of them I know exactly which boat it was. Because that guy's in silhouette, I can't quite remember. Uh, yeah. But yeah, the, the two boats I went out on were both seine netters, and which was a particular style of, of fishing. And yeah, I, I was using Nikons and Leicas, mechanical cameras. I remember having them wrapped in plastic bags to try and protect, protect them from the sea salt, the uh, sea yeah. water. But one of the cameras got pretty drenched, and I remember it getting rusty afterwards. And right. It died. <laughs> And I mean, this is very different to the to the coal mining, right? Because at coal mining, you're just there for a couple of hours. Where here, you're seven days, you're on the boat. There's nowhere else for you to go. You're kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to really explore the boat, explore all the angles. You mm -hmm. know, you, you get to know where people work and where they stand at certain times. You know, like when the net's coming in, like you know where everybody's going to be, and mm -hmm. they all, of course, know, and you know where to stand to keep out the way so you're not about to get whipped by a rope or something. Yep. Uh, yeah, so I was there. I really had plenty of time to to examine all the angles, to experience the work. I mean, even to be honest, at times, I put the cameras down and gutted fish with them just for the experience. All right. Um, and they, you know, they there was no kind of, I wasn't, I mean, I was treated very, very well. They were incredibly hospitable. Uh, but during the night, they all take it in turn to do watch for an hour and a half to make sure the boat doesn't crash into an oil rig or anything. Uh, and I had to do a watch as well. So I had to, there was one guy on this boat, you know, I would, I would get up with him and share a watch with him. So I had to, you know, I wasn't allowed to sleep for eight hours while these guys were uh, working hard. I had to. You had to be a member of the crew. Yeah, yeah, pretty much, yeah. What's uh? This is the the mess, is that right? Yeah, yeah. This is in the me mess room. So yeah. I'm kind of guessing it's probably after dinner at the end of the day. The uh, Stuart, who's got his head in his hands there on the left, yeah. he he uh, you know he's one of the crew, but he also did most of the cooking. He, you know, he looks pretty yeah. exhausted. They're still wearing their overalls. Mm. So so actually, probably it's probably not after dinner. It's probably. No, during the day anyway, because they, they, they'd have their overall trousers on, so they're probably still expecting to go back out again, yeah. back yeah. out on deck again. Yeah. yeah. And this is back up on deck. Yeah, this is, uh, so the fish fish lands and those two wee kind of uh, troughs to the left of the picture, the cod and haddock, and then it gets shoveled through to kind of an undercover section of the boat where it then gets gutted. Yeah, very all very manual work. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And of course, as a photographer, you're you're wanting you know you want dramatic pictures, right? You want you want big waves, and you know I remember talking to the guys going so like, yeah, you know big waves and the pictures would be good, and they just look at me shaking their head. 
And then they, they pointed to they pointed to like a big bulge in the metal wall of the mess room and they said, see that big bulge? That was a wave. <laughs> like, oh shit. You know? And then they so uh oh, just just thinking about this photo, you're you're they're down low. I mean, the, the boats boats hit to bring the, the net in, but that means you're you're way up high. I mean, the, the, the kind of the, the personal yeah. So the, boat, the boat's leaning to one side. They're yeah. they're on the uh, starboard side of the boat, the right hand side of the boat. Uh, the front of the boat would be to the to the left of that picture. Uh, so yeah, I'm standing at the back of the at the back of the wheelhouse, really. Uh, yeah. On the same level, I'm on the same deck as them. But just my side of the ship is, you know, <laughs> ten feet higher because of the uh, the rolling of the ship, you know, the rolling of the boat, and they're they're pulling in the uh, the nets. So yeah. probably in another minute or two, like the the end of the net comes out full of fish. Yeah. But yeah, you just, can see the water on the left there is just about to come over the side. You know? Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking. Yeah, thinking I mean, you get wet on these boats. I mean. You know, when these when these waves from the North Sea smack into you, I mean, it it's cold and it stings. Yeah. <laughs> thinking thinking about uh, this kind of image now, I mean, you said this is you know a couple of years into into your career. Would you go out on a boat like this again and do this kind of work again? You know, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I've, yeah, it's a good question. I would like to. Yeah, and I've thought about it. The mm. this. This set of North Sea pictures has really worked for me well. It's been published a lot. It's been exhibited, you know, very nicely. It's entered the Scottish, Scottish Studies collection. Uh, I'm proud of it. Uh, so, therefore, you're kind of, I feel I would like to add to it. But also, when you think about it and you know it's one of the most dangerous professions, you think, yeah. oh, man. I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> so happy, happy you know, maybe it's are. a joke for younger <laughs> photographers, you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll see, maybe one day. Yeah. Yeah, this was on the Argosy. So this was a boat. This was the second boat I went out on. And they sailed out of Peterhead. Mm -hmm. And uh, this gentleman, this is obviously during the day, they're still getting their overalls on, I can see. Gentleman on the right still get his overalls on. Yep. And uh, yeah, so the, the net is out. So they were just waiting for the fish to swim into the net. So like they, they would put the net out and then circle around to collect the other end of the net and it would be an hour and a half, two hours or so if my memory serves me correct. Uh, so during that two hours while the net was out, you know, they'd be gutting fish from the previous catch, but if all that was done, there would be endless cups of tea, yeah. endless cigarettes, and endless reading of the tabloid newspapers. Like they, had. <laughs> like they had a daily mirror or something like Man, they must have read every word in that newspaper multiple times. So this gentleman on the left is obviously a bit, bit tired. He had a swallow yeah. tattoo on each hand. And if my knowledge of tattoos is correct, eh, a lot of seamen have swallows because a, a swallow always returns home to its nest. So that's why the seamen would have them, because they, they hope to return home to their nest. Indeed. Who's, uh, who's this fella? Uh, this was Andrew Cook. And this, mm. He was on the Myriad, the, the first boat, the first trip. Right. And uh, he was a nice guy. I, yeah, it was a big swell, as you can see. Uh, a, a lot of people look at this picture and go, oh my God, that looks terrible, blah, blah, blah. But actually, it's just a swell, you know? I mean, there's not, there's not really any white water in that. So there's not any, you know, the waves are not crashing over on themselves. Yeah. Uh, it's just a swell, so you're just bobbing up and down in a, yep. in a big way. <laughs> taking it as it taking it as it comes. Yeah, right. yeah this so is the bad, you know. last image. Hey, this is Bill Smith aboard the Argosy out of Peterhead, and on this boat, he was the guy that kind of I be, became pals with in a way, and he kind of looked after me and stuff, made me very welcome. And I would do my shift with him, and. Uh, he used to read his Bible on the boat in the mornings and night, I remember. He was quite a quiet guy. Mm. Uh, this was him securing the nets on the boat, maybe at the end of the day, or I'm not quite sure, but securing the nets. And uh, I had the pleasure, 
a couple of years back, this, this work, uh, I put together a touring exhibition of this work and it went to about eight or nine galleries all up the east coast of Scotland, museums and galleries, all, up to Sh all the way up to Shetland. And uh, Bill and his wife came to one of the exhibitions I had. Uh, so I got to meet him again, which was probably the first time in about 20 years, roughly. And it was really interesting because in the intervening intervening years, the picture had been used a few times in magazines. It appeared in a little kind of zine photo book that I had published of this work. And for this exhibition, uh, this image was used as the kind of the iconic image for the for the exhibition. It was on all the posters for most of the venues. Uh, and I remember tracking him down and just making sure that he was going to be okay with that. Uh, and his family were delighted to hear from me and delighted that this picture was going to be the poster because in the intervening years, Bill's health hadn't been all, all it could have been or maybe all that he and his family would have wanted. And he, his wife explained to me that his grandchildren and his family had never really known Bill as a you know, fit, healthy young man working on the North Sea. So for his grandkids to see him in this picture, working hard, uh, was a slightly different take on their granddad, to the granddad that they knew. Uh, and for that reason, his family were very thankful and very appreciative of the picture and the fact that it was getting seen widely in magazines and posters, etc. cetera. Uh, and it was really lovely to hear, you know, it was really lovely to hear the power of photography and how it can uh, be a record for somebody and to bring back memories and how it can record a different time, uh, sure. a snapshot of life. Uh, and, you know, it was lovely to meet Bill and his wife again and to meet his family and to know that my photography had had that kind of impact for somebody. It was, uh, it was really touching. It was really nice. Yeah, I mean, it really speaks to speaks to the power of of how transcendent, you know, uh, photography can be, and you know, not only uh, time and, and space, but also you know what what a photograph means to 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 people. You know, it yeah. means yeah. something different to every everybody. But the fact that you're able to connect with the family is absolutely, just... and, it, and it was lovely to see him again. And also, when I, when I had the first exhibition on this kind of tour of these pictures, the crew of the first boat, the Myriad, a they lived in the same town as the Scottish Fisheries Museum in Anstruther. And they, mm. so they all came to the opening night of the exhibition. And the skipper, Ronnie Hughes, had lent some of his personal uh, personal effects from his ship, you know, like log books and the bell and stuff. They had lent that to the exhibition. And, and they came along on the opening night. And like I say, this was the first time in like 20 years I'd met them. Yeah. But they came in and immediately you know the jokes and the laughter between us both and it was as if i'd only been on the boat two weeks ago yeah and it was really it was really touching it was really nice, Very uh, nice. and it was nice for them i hope to uh, to see the pictures Absolutely. and that's what you hope you know you hope that people enjoy the pictures you hope that the pictures live on and and that's why i'm so i'm so proud and so pleased when archives such as yourself the school of scottish studies like take an interest in my work and uh, and it means a lot to me as a photographer to have your work enter you know prestigious collections and archives because you you want it to live on you want people to to know about these people to know the work they did and how things happened and what life was like absolutely absolutely and we should we should also say that it's not only the the digital images that have come into the archive but you also produced a, a portfolio of a beautiful set of prints of kind of 50 50 or so prints is that right jeremy uh yeah 51 prints yeah yeah really uh, really nice so we've got both the, the digital record but also physical records um to to, to keep in as as a a marker for for the 70th anniversary but also as a marker for the work as well so yeah and uh, i've also passed over to your your archives lots of uh, cuttings where you can see you can see these pictures in the newspapers like the first time they were published you know as a kind of photo essay by me but also over the years, many times the images were used just to illustrate more generic stories yeah. about fishing. And uh, yeah. I passed those on also, so it sets them in context a little bit, I hope. Yeah.
That's great. All right, Jeremy. Well, thank you very much for your time. Um, uh, more importantly, thank you very much for your work. I mean, well, thank you. Thank you for your interest. It's really uh, it's a privilege to have work in your collection. Absolutely. And I, I'll just say on behalf of both the, the School of Scottish Studies, but also on behalf of the University of Edinburgh, uh, we're very, very proud and very, very happy to have um, some, some of your work in our collection. <laughs>